and thank you all this uh, audience being like uh, participating in this uh, forum. So let me get started. Um, okay, let me start playing. Okay, so um, my talk today is about uh, data analytics. We do uh, the hardware and software co-optimizations for them. So here I'm saying hardware and software, mainly I'm talking about the processors um, or computing um, systems. Um, this is two components. First is uh, this, uh, the systems. Second is the data. So let's see data first, which is closer to all of us. Uh, showing this slide, you can see um, in the top left all the way down, you see a lot of data, right? So you have social network. Um, we use Facebook, Twitter. Um, and uh, right now today we have TikTok. They have some lawsuit about those kind of things, right? Social network. And then we do have a blockchain. Um, I, I think yesterday um, the Ant Finance, they approved using blockchain to be a, a financial like, or officially approved um, way of uh, paying your bills. That's really a big, uh, very encouraging thing. Um, then we have, everybody has uh, the um, heart and then heart simulation, how we deal with the cardiac disease um, by using simulations to combat this disease. Um, and then we have um, thousands of years of history of our knowledge. We have uh, a collection of software. We have internet of things. We have so many things uh, over there, all of them are comprised data. And the bearing the data, are the insights, right? We see um, when we run social network, we know, okay, um, Henry is uh, affiliated with uh, Hong in the same institute, right? And then we probably can do recommendations of Henry's friend and Hong's friend. And then when we run heart simulation, we say, oh, there's probably a problem in the simulation. We probably have to involve some doctors, et cetera, et cetera. I think you guys already understand that um, by computing on data, we extract insights to help the well-being of our society. Okay, um, but unfortunately, computing on this kind of data is really time-consuming. Sometimes it's prohibitively expensive. So that's why we need emerging hardware. Well, among all those emerging hardware, I think GPU or graphics processing unit is one of the most promising hardware that has driven a lot of applications beyond their performance and accuracy ceiling. Among all of them, we have some evidence to show here. For example, if uh, any of you know high performance computing ranking system, they rank the most powerful supercomputers on the planet, right? So uh, the, the, the supercomputers are like uh, uh, very proud. Uh, we have Summit of the United States and then Seria also from United States and then two supercomputers from China and then I think one from Switzerland. Right now, probably Japan takes over the first spot of the top 500. But there's one enormous um, feature of those all the supercomputers, all of them using GPUs. They use GPU or these GPU similar architecture. That means using GPUs really something sort of uh, the, the trend, right? Everybody has to use that. Um, and another thing that we want to bring into our uh, attention is that all those deep learning architectures or machine learning, which is really, we have to make it as national strategy. So, and uh, fortunately, and this also supporting my topic, that is all those um, uh, deep learning libraries, they use GPUs, right? TensorFlow, Cafe, PyTorch, MXNet, all of them using it. We're gonna talk a little bit about it of one of my paper later on. So we see, okay, GPU is really something. We have to take a look at it, right? We cannot talk about a CPU today. Well, beyond that, my research was also using HMC, FPGA, SSD, NVMe, all this kind of emerging hardware to either combating, you know, um, slow storage. I think I bet everybody here understand that. Um, I think 10 years ago, all of us using HDDs, we feel, oh, SSD is really like outlier. Should I use it? But today, when you look, look at your computers, all of them, they use SSDs, right? So the trend is coming and, uh, and it's really ad adopted a lot of uh, those uh, um, either commercial product or those uh, strategic product, right? So it's very important for us to take a look at an emerging hardware and see how we're gonna leverage them to, to solve a lot of problems. So 
once we have these two leading actors of my research come in, then here's the show, right? So we see um, my research is really at an intersection of hardware, software, and data. So we, we put it as a very nice coordinator here. We say, um, in terms of data, we do have those kind of non-relational data, such as ImageNet, right? Such as um, um, some relatively loosely connected data, as well as those uh, um, very well started, started for three centuries of graph data by Eula of uh, 1776, right? We do those kind of, all those kind of data covered. Um, we also do either using emerging hardware, which is very well tailored and uh, has very strong supporting from the community, as well as we redesign the hardware so that um, if we really cannot use those custom, those mainstream hardware to satisfy the need, we do FPGA, we do ASC. Um, well, as far as we know that directly putting something on top of the emerging hardware, typically you have mismatches, right? So that's pretty much um, the expectation. So we have to do some software optimizations. Right? We have to make it better fit on cache, better you less ma massive parallelism, better algorithm, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, we're gonna show you something that previously you feel um, the Jacobi method we learned in, in high school is pretty bad in terms of the efficiency. But when it goes to supercomputer, Jacobi probably outperforms all those very, very um, advanced algorithm. One of them example is gaussian Seidel algorithm, right? So something changed, flipped. Right. So we have to take a look at it again. Okay, so then I'm gonna really cover three um, interesting topics of how we do hardware, software, co-design, data analytics, right? So, um, so the first project is, is deep learning. Okay, so everybody has to talk about deep learning. So I'm also talking about that, but I wanna show you something pretty interesting here. Uh, that is, uh, on the top left side, we see um, a language translator. You have uh, the input is, uh, I think it's French, and then the output is uh, English, right? So I am a student. Um, you input this and output that. Or you can do um, real-time audio transcripting, something like that, right? So how we do that? Um, Actually, they have a model in the, uh, in the um, bottom left. You have inputs uh, from the encoder and then you have outputs from the decoder. You do a couple of matrix translations so that you figure out, oh, actually I am eating should follow some food. When I'm drinking should follow some, um, some you know, either drinking materials or waters or whatever. So that means the context matters. So that's something we use matrix manipulation to capture, which is also very well researched by machine learning folks. Well, that's very good. But the thing is, if it's prohibitively expensive, it takes seconds to do translation for a sentence. Probably nobody gonna tolerate that. Think about it. If I'm um, like uh, talking here and uh, some people cannot really understand my English very well. They want to see the transcript, but every second they can only translate one sentence. When I'm already talking about deep learning, they are still in the domain of uh, maybe data mining, right? So that's really pretty bad. So the thing is here, we see the size of the model is uh, around the millions, right? You can see here um, in the right side. And the time is probably seven to, um, I think seven something, microsecond if you add that together to an encode to a uh, translation model right now it's like around 3.5 microsecond if you have a couple of them together i think everybody heard about gp uh, gpt3 so that's really seconds tens of seconds of translations that's too long right so what do we do is we um tailor this um this uh, system we make on the fly optimizations. We make some tensor core optimizations, which is very, very uh, interesting hardware optimizations. You can take a look at it in my paper. Um, we reduce the time, see here, 3000 microseconds to 25 microseconds. 
right? It's a single GPU. We can make it even, even, even better, right? So, um, so you can see that uh, you have very good hardware. You have uh, some slow software. You really need something to bridge the gap, right? So this is why we are here. Um, okay. Um, the second thing, I think when we talk about machine learning, everybody knows that. Um, when we talk about graph, I just want to talk about the challenge of it. For example, um, if uh, we know that why, um, let's put it this way, why GPU is so popular in supercomputing. Right? So the reason is really because uh, supercomputing ranks supercomputers by dense linear al algebra. Right? So it's like matrix, matrix multiplication, so, so regular. Every entry mapped to every process, and then communication is local. So many things that feels so um, natural. That's why graphics can go to linear algebra, right? Can rank supercomputers. But when we talk about a graph social network, you know that um, I have no reason to be connected to Henry, and Henry probably have no reason to be connected to, uh, you know, maybe Trump. Right, so some other people, right? So, but they happen to be connected, right? They have connections, they find their path. This is called six degree separation, right? I think everybody in data mining knows that. So, um, and also some people have so many followers, some people has very few followers, right? So we see uh, the mapping of this linear algebra to GPU as opposed to graph mapping to GPU is really totally different. Leveraging emerging hardware is exciting. Challenge is what's over there, right? So we have to face it. We see, I give it a very interesting name. We see GPU is single instruction multiple data with CMD, right? Everybody learned about CMD in computer related um, hardware and lectures. We see it's CMD. And then graph is complex. It's really complex in terms of, uh, I even, when I was talking to my student, I'm, I'm even joking, saying, "Okay, you are doing some research. That's the last chapter of the data of the graph um, algorithm or of the algorithm course because this is very complex in terms of control flow, in terms of memory access pattern, in terms of uh, even how to do it, right? How to because it's the last chapter. That means a lot of people even skip it. Right? So, how to bridge the gap of making this kind of twisted uh, mapping from graph to GPU?" well sorted, so GPU don't get confused. Right? Um, this is a, a paper we published in last year on a, a pretty good vanity of Usenix ATC. We talk about how to make it better and, and uh, um, more suitable to so some inspirations over there. If you are interested, take a look, okay. Um, okay, my time is almost, is already uh, up. So let me just, see, I'm sorry, just the one more advertisement. I'm also working with some DOE folks, Department of Energy. We make uh, um, linear algebra solvers much faster. See here in the in the figure, we make it around uh, 10 times faster using a lot of GPUs. I think right now it's around 1,000 GPUs. Uh, taken together, we got a paper um, submitted to a conference and it's also open access in archive. All together um, is linear data is colorful and it's beautiful, it's useful. Well, hardware is forced to, to make innovations, but in order to take advantage of this hardware, they cannot just sit, at all, sit on, it top, on, top, on top of those emerging hardware directly. We have to bridge a gap and there's a lot of things we can extract. That's our research, okay, thanks. Hey, thanks much, Han, uh, outstanding work. Uh, excellent the presentation. So questions from the audience. Once again, please make sure you unmute yourself as well as identify yourself as well before you ask questions. Okay, audience, please. And if not, uh, Han, I have a question. You said that, that you are working at the intersection, right? Of uh, hardware, software, and data. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, Clearly, there is also very complex interplays, right, between the three branches, if you will. Uh, at the end, what is the most challenging aspect? Hardware or software or data? And from 
my sort of point of view, maybe hardware is that uh, uh, something that you would agree or? Um, right, um, I would say yes, I agree um, for a lot of uh, like junior faculties like us or some people don't really know how the pipeline of hardware, definitely hardware is very challenging, right? So many people, so many components, um, but for people who are expert about hardware, maybe they're gonna tell us, I, I actually talked to some expert, uh, they said, okay, it's really, I know the hardware, okay? I'm like a doctor. I've been um, diagnosing some disease for 70 years. So I know that. And then how to uh, invent something that better leverage the hardware and how to really co-design them is very challenging. Um, but for me, um, I feel still feel okay. Hardware is really challenging for me to educate a student in five years. Um, right, so that's the answer. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, uh, at some point, quantum computing will help us break down the hardware barrier. Right. Uh, yeah, so that's that's very exciting. Yeah. Right. 